25 secrets that players such as you may not know about Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Here we go. Did you ever wonder where your character is from when you travel to Hoenn for the first time? Well, this is a question that many might have wondered about, and it is never actually stated by your mother or father in the game when you move to Little Root Town, where you originally came from. But there is an answer to this question. In the Pokemon Adventures manga in the Ruby and Sapphire chapters, it is stated that the character Ruby, which is the manga version of Brendan, who you play as in these games, is actually from Johto. Kind of strange, but it is officially canon, as the manga is the canon version towards the games of where characters are from and such as that. So there you go. Oh, you're essentially from Johto originally when you come to Hoenn. Did you ever wonder what was behind this strange door in Moss Deep City? Well, we got an answer for you. Well, if you had access to an e-card reader for your Game Boy Advance, you could use it to read e-cards, which were special cards distributed that if scanned would give you access to this room, where you could battle special trainers that would have strange teams and odd combinations of Pokemon. So during a data mine of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, some files were found, and some of these are some really weird unused sprite versions of the acrobike where the player is doing a front like front wheel wheelie which is quite odd to say the least this however is never actually used because there is no input for this sort of action to happen in the game there's no button to press for it to happen and there's no way to kind of bunny hop to cause this sprite to appear so it's a sprite that's never actually used it's kind of just there underneath the bridge on route 120 where you meet steven who helps you uncover the kecleon which is there there's a little lake and in the middle of that lake, if you go down there and surf, there is a tiny cave that you can surf to and access. This is a small and tucked away space that unless you ever come back to this area in the future, you know, with surf, you could easily forget it even existed as the game doesn't actually have you ever coming back here for other reasons. This is the Scorched Slab and inside you can find TM11, also known as Sunny Day. Another interesting fact about this specifically and about the Scorched Slab is that it is based on Amano Iwato, a Japanese mythological cave, which is said to have housed Amaterasu, the Japanese goddess of the sun, who was driven there by her brother, Susano, the god of storms. So it fits perfectly together that there would be a TM-11 for sunny day inside of there, matching with Amaterasu, the Japanese goddess of the sun. There were actually early hints to the dream world in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. These can be found in the Devon Corporation's headquarters located in Rossboro City. There's an NPC there that you can speak to, who will tell you that he's working on a machine that will visualize the dreams of Pokemon. This does seem like a direct hint towards the dream world feature added into the future games pokemon black and pokemon white so there was an early way way for them to kind of hint at it for well, a decade later almost. Ruby and Sapphire were the Pokemon games where the tagline, gotta catch them all, disappeared. And this was a kind of a business decision made by the Pokemon company and Nintendo to avoid possible liability. As the games by this point didn't always feature all Pokemon, so it could be seen as false marketing to give people the perception or ID that the games had all of them in there for you to capture, when in reality, not all of them would be able to be caught in the games. Though Fire Red Leaf Green did try to include all the Pokemon from Ruby, Sapphire, and all the previous generations into a singular game, but the tagline was sort of dropped going forward because of liability. If you completed the Pokedex and finished the whole of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, you could be rewarded with a special diploma that you would receive from one of the Game Freak employees found inside the games. But the coolest thing is that you could actually then display this reward in your secret base as a way to show off to others that you had achieved the highest of accolades and had finished the whole Pokedex and, and all of Hoenn's adventures, so just a great way to show off. There's a weird instance in the museum in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire that is sort of strange, where basically the museum is taken over by either Team Aqua or Team Magma, where if you don't have enough money on you when you try to enter it, a certain scenario will play out. See, if you don't have enough money, you can't enter it to play out the story. But to fix this, instead of having to pay, the lady at the counter, she will basically mistake you as a Team Magma or Team Aqua grunt and simply let you enter for free. Now, this essentially exists to stop you from potentially softlocking yourself into a game ending situation or, you know, just basically getting stuck forever and having a game over at that point. Never wanted to get rare furniture 
in Ruby and Sapphire? Well, the only place for that will be the Lily Cove department store's rooftop sales. This is a place where you can go to and purchase things such as fences for your secret base and even pokey dolls and a toy television. This is something I overlooked as a kid when I was playing and I'm sure some of you may have as well, but if you ever needed certain items, this was a place where you could go to to buy furniture. Some of the stuff that you may not have known about Pokemon Ruby and Pokemon Sapphire is that it basically in the beta version, why not was colored green rather than the color we know it as today being its signature blue. So yeah, it was actually green colored, which is really strange. And they had a different sprite actually for Shroomish as well. The original release date for Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire was meant to actually be based on the files found in the game, March 17th, 2003. This, however, was changed and they ended up releasing earlier on November 21st of 2002, which kind of an interesting case, but this was all filed in documents that essentially they were planning on releasing it later. There exists a file in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire of a character from the NES game Mendel Palace, which was also used in Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald. So this, this file was there. Now the game Mendel Palace was the first ever game developed by Game Freak, the developers of the Pokemon franchise. And I guess they must have used this model as a placeholder temporarily just to try things out. It does kind of reminiscently look a little bit like the character when you are surfing with the character and that's about it. The city of Marvile in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire is actually the French name of the city of Violet City from Johto and yeah it's a bit strange and this is because the French name of the city in Johto is Lavandia which is also the German name of Lavender Town. So yeah, a bit of a weird mishmash of names where they kind of overlap in a strange way. The only way to ever see a shiny Celebi in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire was to use Ditto or a Pokemon that had transformed and have that Pokemon be a shiny and then face off against a Celebi. This was the only way to see shiny Celebi in the games as there was no legitimate way to get your hands on them in any way whatsoever Otherwise, the only way to use, actually get it, was to use cheats to get the shiny, but no other way works as the game checks to see if the Pokemon is legitimate, and if it's not, it just simply won't work. So yeah, it's kind of a strange way where you have to use a ditto, basically, to you know, see a shiny Celebi. It's kind of strange. There's quite a bit of unused music in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. There is a test theme for the Little Root, which is a weird one. Then there is also Route 38 and 39 themes from Gold, Silver, and Crystal. But the most strange one has to be that there is the Suicune, Raikou, and Entei battle theme from Crystal in the files of Ruby and Sapphire, which could imply that at some point it was perhaps planned to include them in the game as roaming legendaries for us to capture. Perhaps this was scrapped due to the existence of Latios and Latias already being in there, so it would have been redundant to include a whole nother set of roaming legends, so guess they must have skipped it for that reason. So you may or may not have heard of the Berry Glitch. This is a glitch that can basically prevent time-based events from occurring, and one of these is the growth of berries, as they use the internal clock to grow. Now, this glitch was so detrimental because it would freeze you from being able to have any further real-time passing in-game events actually happening until a total of 366 days had passed from the day of the glitch actually starting to start counting again. So you would need to wait essentially a year before the actual clock in the game, the real-time clock, would start working again. Now, this would make a lot of things impossible to do in the games, but there was a way to solve this glitch through a patch, a quite weird way to actually patch. You needed to get the Berry Program update, which was included with Pokemon Colosseum, Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, and the Pokemon Box Ruby and Sapphire box that was for the GameCube. And you would then need to use like these patches or these CDs or whatever to fix the bug by connecting your Game Boy to your GameCube uh, and Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire wouldn't be the, you know, need to be in there. By connecting these two, you'd give the patch over to the game. Now, this is due to, at the time, there not being any sort of way to send online updates to fix these sort of things because this was something very internal in these games that was just really strange. Now, what did this patch actually do? Well, essentially, it just sets, you know, your time played or your, like, real time in the actual game back to before the glitch, which is a bit odd. So, yeah, or it sets you, you know, over that actual 366 days so that the glitch won't be in effect anymore, which is really strange. There are three in-game trades that you can easily end up missing in Ruby and Sapphire. One is found in Rossboro City, where an NPC wants to trade a Slack Off for a Makuhita. Then there is a trade in Fortry for a Pikachu for a Skitty. And finally, you have Blossom for a Corsola in Pacific Lodge Town. All of these are easily missed if you don't talk to every NPC, and you also may not always end up having certain Pokemon to trade, so you simply ignore it and move on. I missed 
60s all the time. So there is this one weird tile that cannot be surfed on. See, on Route 134, there's a tiny little tile which you can surf on or walk on, just an odd one. And this one actually does come in handy if certain things need to happen, like if you want to perform glitches and stuff, this one actually is really useful. And we'll do a future video relating to glitches in these games. You can get a extra Master Ball. Now, you might think this sounds a bit weird because, yeah, obviously you can get a Master Ball, but that's only one, a singular one, after you defeat the evil team and whatnot, and you're given that so you can usually catch the legendary. But there is another way to get an extra Master Ball, which is the following. You would need to go to Lily Cove Lot Lottery, which is a lottery where you need to get lucky that your trainer ID number matches up with the lottery number. Now, for you to win a master ball you need to have five of your numbers on your trainer id your digits to actually match with the lottery if you don't have five but you have you know less of them like let's say four you can get a max revive instead if you have three digits you get an exp share and if you have two digits you get a pp up you can come back every in-game day to try this out for a chance to actually get an extra master ball so as long as you come back you can always try it out and see if you get lucky and get an extra master ball i think it's a very great way for them to sort of give us extra thingies that we might need. In this case, we need Master Balls. You can get a free Pokemon egg from the weird ladies in the hot springs at Lava Ridge Town. She would give you a Pokemon egg, which when it hatches, will have a Why Not inside of it. Speaking of Why Nots, ever wanted to visit Mirage Island? Now, this is the island where we got the first ever baby Pokemon in the wild for the first time. But to get to Mirage Island, you will need to find it first. And this is done by talking to the old man in one of the houses in Pacific Lodge Town. And if you are lucky, you will have the numbers to match the randomly generated numbers, which goes up to 65,535. Now, this all depends on your Pokemon's personality values matching up with the number that the old man or the system has, right? And if you do have those matching up, then you're granted, uh, you know, essentially access to the island for a single in-game day. You can head there and you can get yourself Liechi Berry to create gold Pokeblocks, which are really useful. And of course, you can also find the one and only Wild Why Nots that range from level 5 to level 50. I don't know if you guys know about this, but Shoal Cave's weird mechanic. So Shoal Cave has a strange high tide and low tide mechanic where certain areas are only reachable during a specific time of the day, making the area far less accessible during high tides compared to low tides. And if you want to get a snow run for your Pokedex, for example, you will need to wait until the low tide comes in to actually find it in there. So this starts around 3 a.m. to 8.59 a.m. and 3 p.m. to 8.59 p.m. So that's the only time you can get the low tide, which makes the more of the area accessible. There are some really strange prototype versions of Pokemon that you may not have seen, such as the early Torchic with weird ears, which you can see right here, a mix of a Latias and a Blaziken being fused with a random trainer flying on top of them, and an early Trico looking a bit scuffed, as well as a droopy and sad Groudon included here as well. So did you catch the Regis back in the day? Well, most people didn't, hence why I include this right here. These guys were kind of strange. You see, the Reggie trio that first came out into the spotlight during Generation 3 was only accessible by you as the player completing a certain set of steps to get your hands on all three. However, due to many players back then not having access to guides as easily, it was hard for most, including myself, to ever capture the Regis, hence why many ended up overlooking them through their journeys. But to actually get all of them, you had to go through a process, and on the screen you'll see sort of all the methods you had to do for each individual one. If you want to know more about that, you can always check it out on the internet. So this one is a bit strange, but it has to do with the battery in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, which is a CR1616 lithium battery, which eventually will run out of charge. These things do run out. And when it does, you may get a message in the game which notifies you that your internal battery has run dry. If this happens, nothing major will happen to your actual save file besides that certain events will no longer occur. So this is similar to the berry glitch. So any events that kind of relied on a clock-based system will no longer function. So events such as the berry growth or the shoal cave tides, which we mentioned earlier, will no longer function the same way. And this does come with a strange situation because you were, like, let's say if you were to switch out the battery and replace it, it wouldn't make a difference. After all, the game at the point of the battery running dry will timestamp itself for your initial date to the moment the battery died. And for the system to function again, you will need to essentially play the game for the same length of time. So if you played the game for three years before the battery ran dry, you will now need to play for another three years with a new battery for the new timestamp in the game to catch up to the old one and for the game to start counting its time once again. So yeah, kind of a weird situation, especially if you go back to play your old games and the battery is dry they're like this is kind of an odd one right but this is like one of the reasons why i think 
they should re-release the old games on the Nintendo Switch, like Ruby and Sapphire would be great, or even Emerald and Fire Red Leaf Green should be allowed to be put back on the eShop. That's it. Thank you for watching. We'll be doing Gold, Silver, Crystal next, most likely. We'll see.